Mr. President and uh, Mesdames Presidents of the community uh, in British Columbia and in Ontario, uh, wonderful to be able to, to recognize uh, these excellent women of the, of the Ismaili community. I'm very pleased to be here because in the days before I had political retirement thrust upon me by the Canadian electorate, um, <laughs> I enjoyed the support of many members of the Ismaili community. And one of the things that always struck me was not only its dynamism, but the sophistication of the community. Two things struck me. One was the extraordinary accomplishments of the women of the community. And it was very clear to me that this was a community where women were expected and encouraged to achieve and develop themselves. I was also very struck by the quality of the work that you do around the world through the Aga Khan Foundation. And I remember a number of years ago, there was an excellent display of this uh, in Vancouver. We're trying to figure out where it was because it wasn't here, it was somewhere else in the city. Um, one of the people that I became very good friends with was Nurjahan Mawani, who's done a number of amazing things. And I last saw her in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, where she was running the Aga Khan Foundation programs. And we had a wonderful time there. She is now in Kabul, and I worry about her because I don't think that's the easiest place to be. But I think her activities really represent the kind of vision and reach that the Ismaili community has through the Aga Khan Foundation in taking the benefits of all that you have accomplished and your own sophistication, your own enlightenment to many other countries of the world to help communities develop and achieve their goals socially, economically, and politically. So it's an honor and delight for me to be here and speak to you today. I was asked when I spoke to the organizers to address the question of the role of women leaders. Uh, and in particular, they talked about the role of women in, uh, in working with men to create a more ethical society. I want to address these, these issues, and I'm going to take a somewhat circuitous route that has something to do with my own development and understanding on the issues. Again, when I had my political retirement thrust upon me, as I've said, I had come out of a very interesting number of years where I had been the first woman to do many things, the first woman minister of justice, the first woman defense minister, and it's interesting. I remember my first NATO meeting, um, which happened to be a meeting with the North Atlantic Cooperation Council. This was back in 1993, when the North Atlantic Cooperation Council brought together the, the ministers of defense of the former Warsaw Pact countries in NATO. And I had been a Soviet specialist, and there was I sitting there in Brussels with the Russian minister, Pavel Grachov, across from me and the Czech minister, and thinking, should they be here in NATO headquarters? I mean, is this, is this all right? Um, but it was a sign of, 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 of the change, although recent history in Russia may suggest that my, my reservations were well based. But I had experienced uh, a lot of things that had perplexed me. And so after I had, I had written a memoir and I had gone off and I'd served for four years as um, Consul General in Los Angeles, I was invited to become one of the inaugural group of fellows at the new Center for Public Leadership at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And while I was there, the dean said to me, well, when are you going to come and teach for us? So the next fall, I began uh, as a, a professor of practice, they called me, at the Kennedy School. And I taught two courses. One was a course on democratic transition and consolidation, and the other was a course called Gender and Power. And in the course on gender and power, I was able to make use of a growing body of literature that began to appear in the 1990s that helped me to understand many of the things that I had experienced as a woman being the first woman in the positions that I had held. And I came to understand it's not just gender, but when you are the first of your kind of person to hold a job that's traditionally been held by other kinds of people, there is a reaction that people have that isn't an intellectual reaction, it's a visceral reaction. I came to understand that we all have implicit attitudes that come from the lessons that we learn from the landscape from which we learn how the world works. Uh, a writer, Virginia Vallian, wrote a book called Why So Slow? The Advancement of Women. And she calls these hypotheses that we create schemas, gender schemas. And from the time we're born, we are observing, we are learning, quite independent of what our parents or our school teachers or any of the other influences in our society try to teach us, we are learning the lessons of how our world works. And so as we get older, even though intellectually our values may change, there are still certain reactions that we have when we see something that doesn't correspond to the world as we think we know it. 
And so, for example, if you are the first woman prime minister, you will encounter that, particularly among the Ottawa Press Gallery, uh, one of whose members once said to me with a visibly curled lip, you know, I've known every prime minister since Lester Pearson. And the implication was, and you don't look or sound like any of them, which was quite true. But what is interesting, that there was a psychologist at Harvard called Dr. Banerjee who created something called the Implicit Attitudes Test. And implicit attitudes are these deeply rooted attitudes that we don't necessarily articulate. And I, of course, pride myself on being you know, very progressive on women's issues and the ultimate feminist. And I took her test. You sit in front of your laptop and you press keys as, you, as images flash. And there were two kinds of areas of attitudes that the test was looking at. I looked at the one dealt with gender. There was another one that dealt with age. And I was horrified to discover, after I had taken this test, that I associated men with science much more than women. And I thought, oh, this is terrible because I, you know, strongly support women in science. But all this did was point out that in my life, most of the scientists I had seen were men. So my implicit attitude was to think of scientist equals man. And I think it's very important for us to understand that when we have these implicit attitudes, we don't have them because we're bad, because we're mean, because we don't want to give people a chance. We have them because we're human. And very often, our intellectual attitudes, our social development has moved beyond those attitudes. But they still come and get in the way. And I'll give you an example. During the leadership campaign in 1993, a columnist called Lizanne Gagnon wrote about how she thought I was uh, being treated very unfairly by the press relative to Jean Charest, that there was a lot of sexism. But interestingly enough, during the general election campaign, she wrote a column one time where she complained that I was always wearing the same earrings. <laughs> now, these were not sparkly, you know, chandelier-type earrings which would have been inappropriate to the prime ministerial earlobe. They were mild-mannered, inoffensive pearl earrings. But what I came to, and I couldn't figure it out. I thought, you know, here's somebody, you know, who had been so adamant about the sexism during the leadership campaign, and now she's writing this. What is this all about? Years later, when I began to read this literature, I came to understand that it wasn't about the earrings. There was something about me that made her uncomfortable. And maybe, and, and even women can be uncomfortable with women doing non-traditional things. Just because we're women doesn't mean we necessarily are on the barricades. We, we're products of a culture where leadership is often gendered masculine. And I, I'm not sure whether it was that I was a woman or maybe that I wasn't a Quebecer. Uh, that could have been it too. I don't know. It certainly wasn't the earrings. That was it. So in my life, I've come to understand, in the opportunity that I've had to do a lot of reading in social and cognitive uh, psychology, come to understand that there are many ways in which we think, many ways in which we act, which where we think we know why we're doing it, but we don't really know. And so one of the challenges that women have faced is to overcome the resistance that people have because they have precon preconceptions about what they're about. And there's a famous study, and if, if those of you have heard about it, just roll your eyes while I tell you again. But one of the studies that I used in my course was one done by uh, an economist at Harvard called Claudia Golden. And she was studying the way symphony orchestras auditioned to hire new musicians. And the great thing about reading the actual paper is that before she gets into her data, she talks about the interviews she has done with these symphony conductors. And they all say, oh, no, there's no gender bias in our selection. No, no, we're just interested in the quality of the playing. But a number of them say words to the effect of, but of course, you realize women do have small technique. So what she discovered is that when the orchestra's auditioned behind a screen and with a carpet so that the adjudicators have no idea who's playing, they can't hear footsteps, they can't see who's playing, they hire anywhere from 35 to 55% more women. Because if you think you're going to hear small technique, you will hear small technique. And so we have to understand that as we are aiming to do things that traditionally people like us, whether it's women or people of color or disabled people, or there's all kinds of categories of people who encounter these kind of exclusionary predispositions, we have to understand that the deep attitudes, the resistance can be, can be very visceral, and we have to work hard to overcome them. But what is interesting today is when I look back at the days, for example, when I was a young, uh, aspirant graduate student looking to, to go to graduate school. 
the kinds of conversations we have now are very different because in those days, women weren't included. Women were struggling to get into law school, graduate school. They were struggling to get accepted into certain positions. Uh, and sometimes they were welcome if they were seen as an anomaly. You know, Margaret Thatcher, if Margaret Thatcher had been on the barricades to include women and said, now, if you choose me as leader of the Conservative Party, I'm going to bring in a hundred other women and I'm going to put them all in, she wouldn't have been very successful. But, you know, you had to sort of just be, you know, I, I'm different from the others, I will be the anomaly. But a number of women managed to succeed in getting into positions that over the last couple of decades, they now create a critical mass for doing a different kind of research. And that is the research on how they really function and how they really uh, add, uh, add to or don't add to the milieu in which they're able to be included. And this has created a very interesting development in terms of our expectations of whether women should be on corporate boards, whether they should be in parliaments. And that is because now that we have serious research about how women do when they're in these, these positions, it has confounded many people because it has shown that in fact women add enormously to the value of the of an organizational organization's activities so for example credit suisse the uh the conservative swedish a uh, swiss rather uh bank has recently produced a report and incidentally this is not the first there are many such as this but credit suisse is just one of the, the more recent ones which argues that when women are in high levels of corporate management or when they're on corporate boards, that there is a measurable, very significant increase in return on investment, return on assets, uh, functioning of the organization. There was a time when, when we would try to urge companies to put women on their boards and they'd say, well, you know, we, you know, they're very dear and we would like to have a few and, uh, you know, it would be very nice, but what would we say to our shareholders, you know, and how could we justify it? I mean, what about the bottom line? Well, now we know that the bottom line is seriously enhanced when you have women on corporate boards, when you have them in high levels of management. There was a recent article in the Harvard Business Review that was quite fascinating. They were looked at the performance of a number of different groups on tests. And in some of the groups, their performance, the performance of the group was sort of the average, reflected the average intelligence of every member of the group. But there were some groups where the collective intelligence of the group was higher than the intelligence of the single most intelligent person in the group. Say, so how could that be? Well, you know what the variable was? The presence of women. When women were in these groups, they performed better than the single most intelligent able person of that group would have performed. There is a dynamic that takes place that enables groups to perform better when women are part of it. So there is an enormous amount of research now that is showing us that organizations and groups will be more effective if women are included. Now, it isn't just, I mean, women is very important, but the principle of diversity goes even, even broader. There was a wonderful issue of the Scientific American recently. The cover article is diversity, and if you see the cover, it's good to look at. Because it talks about diversity and the importance of it, and particularly the inclusion of women, but not just women. And there are a lot of ways in which we think diversity is good. We say, well, it's good, we'll have different points of view, and that will be very helpful. But in fact, one of the points they make is that when you have diverse groups making decisions, the individuals of that group perform better that if we're always with people who are just like us, we'll be sloppy in the ways that we communicate because we assume, oh, you know, you, you know what I mean. But if you're with a group of people, maybe some speak your language as a second language, they don't have the same cultural references that you have, they, have, uh, they come from different sectors of the economy, you can't say that. You have to work harder at explaining what you're about. And that is one of the reasons why diversity makes organizations function better. So all through the social sciences now, we are finding that what we used to argue for on the basis of truth, beauty, and justice turns out to be valuable on the basis of the hard-nosed concepts of efficacy and good performance. 
You know, when women sit on corporate boards, and I've sat on corporate boards, one of the reasons why people say that, that they have a very powerfully positive effect on the culture of the boards is, first of all, they read the board materials. <laughs> Now, maybe they read the board materials because they know they're going to be judged at a higher standard and they don't want to be caught out. But what happens is, when you get women on a board and they come to the meetings and they've read the board materials, what happens is, the men start reading the board materials. <laughs> and the overall performance of the board improves. So today, when we're arguing about the importance of including women, in decision-making bodies. We're no longer in the please, 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 please let me in, please I promise I'll be good. We're in the stage where now the question is, how do you justify the exclusion? And now we have things like the Canadian Securities Association having um, a, a, a policy that they say comply or explain. In other words, if you're not putting women on your boards, if you have no women in your senior manager management, explain why. Because the presumption is now that that is an inferior way of structuring the decision making in your company. So it is a wonderful time to be talking about these issues because now we can look at what are the mechanisms for getting people together? What are the mechanisms for improving representation? What are the mechanisms for allowing diversity to really work for us in our organizations? How do we get there? How do we recruit people? We recruit people. And incidentally, diversity isn't that easy, whether it's gender diversity or more broadly based diversity. It's not enough to bring people into an organization if you don't change the way the organization is structured. In the early days of, uh, say, around the, the, the 1990s, I guess, when corporations were trying to bring more women into their, their management, uh, a lot of the women didn't stay. And they say, well, you know, we brought them in and they, they leave, you know, what can we do? Well, one of the reasons they left was because nothing else changed. And they came into environments where they couldn't function. They were hostile environments. They were very male-dominated environments. And they just eventually said, what the heck? Why am I doing this? I'm going to go start my own business rather than dealing with that. So now we are also at a stage in our understanding, and a lot of this is coming from wonderful research that people are doing, to help us to make better use of people. And I'll bet all of us in this room have had experiences where we've been part of the majority on an organization or in a board, and sometimes when we've been a minority, when we have not been like everybody else. And what is really important is to create an environment where everybody can speak in their own voice, where they can make a contribution. Now, this brings me to this question of how men and women can work together and how women leaders can play a role. We've seen that women have something to offer. And I don't think women are better than men. I think those kind of conversations are really a mugs game. So many of the people that I admire the most, people who supported me, people both living and people who, you know, from centuries ago who wrote wonderful things that inspire me and elevate my understanding, have been men. And often men are more supportive than women than some women are because some women are still at a stage where they feel competitive, they're not sure that women are really going to be accepted, and so they still have, have those visceral attitudes that they had growing up, and they can't really, really open it. But, you know, it's interesting. After the terrible financial meltdown in 2008 on Wall Street, there was a very interesting demonstration in that catastrophe that a lot of very expensively educated male leaders had been egregious leaders. And after that very humbling experience for the titans of industry and the you know, masters of the universe when they went off to Davos, where they all gather every year, some of you may know, uh, one of the debates was, what would have happened if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters? <laughs> and again, there is a lot of interesting research that shows that when you have all-male institutions, very often it leads to excessive risk-taking. I think the conclusion was that it would have been better if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Brothers and sisters. And I think this is the thing we have to, we have to grapple with now, is that the optimal situation, I think, is men and women working together. And when we talk about ethical leadership, ethical leadership isn't just a question of cheating and not paying your income tax and 
you know, uh, you know, fudging the books or, you know, not, you know, hiding the, the product reliability reports, all of those kinds of things. Ethics is also doing the very best for your organization. So you can avoid things like the collapse at Lehman Brothers. If you read the story of Lehman Brothers, the whole decision-making structure was designed for disaster. It was designed for groupthink. There were people on the bond floor, bond trading floor, who could see what was happening with the mortgage securities on the floor above, but they were making so much money and there were so many zeros. I mean, you, you read about these things and you can't imagine all those zeros on the end of the amounts of money people were making. There were people who saw, but the institution was structured to shut those people out. And so when we look at how we make decisions, when we look at how people work together, there is a strong ethical component because real flesh and blood people are affected. When Lehman Brothers collapsed, they took with them a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people's life savings, not least of which were the people who worked for Lehman Brothers, who throughout their careers were urged to spend their bonuses on Lehman Brothers stock. And in their loyalty and belief in the company, they did that. But many other people are affected. And so part of ethical leadership really requires us to think, what are the best ways that we can make decisions? How can we run our companies? How can we run our governments? How can we run all of our organizations in ways that will protect us from the kind of incompetence that comes, not deliberately because we want to do ill, but because we are not making decisions in the best way. We are not hearing the voices we need to hear. I don't want a company where there's no capacity to take risk. Of course we want risk. But we also want people saying, wait a minute, how big is that risk? Can we hedge that risk? Who will be affected? What are the stakes? Is this an appropriate risk for us to take or is it not appropriate risk for us to take? And the different voices that participate in those discussions are what make forward thinking sound decisions possible for any organization. It's in a government. You know, if you have a bunch of people sitting around and, you know, and, you know, all, the, all they want to do is, you know, we have nukes, let's, you know, let's nuke people or let's go to war, or let's do things. You know, let's have a really tough response without thinking about what the impact is going to be. That's not the best decision. And so I think what women leaders have to offer is another voice, another way of looking at things. And again, you can't, you can't generalize. Not all women are alike. I was recently in Prince Edward Island in a project called uh, Bold Vision. In Charlottetown in 1864, the Fathers of Confederation met. And that was the beginning of the process that in 1867 would result in Canadian Confederation. So some people in Prince Edward, Edward Island thought, well, wouldn't it be great if in 150 years later, in 2014, we had another Charlottetown conference, only this time, instead of 23 men, we'd have 23 women. And they would, you know, design their bold vision for the next 150 years of Canada. Well, it was interesting because we all got there. I, when I got the invitation, I thought, you know, I'm the only woman who was ever prime minister. I better show up. <laughs> but it was an amazing group. It was women, you know, I'm, you know, no longer a spring chicken, but I felt like a pup because Hazel McCallion, who at 93 was just finishing her last term as mayor of Mississauga, was there. <laughs> she scares the wits out of me. I mean, she's... <laughs> So there were, there were older women, there were young women, a young woman, a young African-Canadian woman, we don't really use that expression, but that was her origins, who is the poet laureate of Halifax. And she started out our meeting with this kind of, you know, rap type poem, and we're all going, oh, wow, hoo-ha. Um, there, were, there, were, uh, there were scientists, there were artists, there were business people, there were people from Quebec, there were people, First Nations people, people from none of, I mean, it, women from all over, they were all different. It was absolutely fascinating. There was one woman who was an independent MP from Quebec, who of Lebanese origin, and I think she must have come to Canada after I was in government. Because one of her things that she was felt very strongly about was the importance of opening up the Constitution, finally. And I said, oh, no, please, please, no. And I guess people took her aside and talked to her a little bit about Meech Lake and Charlottetown. And she didn't change her view, but she sort of put her arm around me and she said, I know, you tried, you tried. <laughs> but what was interesting, of these 23 women of all different ages, we didn't agree on anything. And, 
you know, women don't all think alike. And it was hilarious because at first, I, you know, I was getting worried. We're not going to be able to come up with a declaration because we are just, we all see the world so differently, both generationally in terms of where we come from in the country and what we do for a living and how we see things in our political uh, leanings, etc. So the point is, you're not going to be able to get, you know, just a few women and that'll be the women's voice. But what was exciting about that experience was hearing all of these women's voices and thinking, you know, what great contributions they make to our conversations about the country. So we need to create a way in which women and men can work together to create an ethical society, which isn't just an ethical society where we know right from wrong, but an ethical society where we say we owe it to our country, we owe it to our society, we owe it to our organizations to be as smart as we possibly can be. And that means bringing together as many people as possible and giving them a chance to have a voice in that decision making. And, and it's so wonderful today to be able to pursue that idea with all of the kind of research that tells us that this is not something we're doing just for truth, beauty, and justice, because I think truth, beauty, and justice is great. But it doesn't move a lot of people to change the way they've done things forever. You have to sort of have another pragmatic reason. Yes, it's truth, beauty, and justice, but it's also good for efficacy. Your company will be more profitable. You will eat the competition's lunch. You know, I was in, I'm doing this work in Edmonton, and a few weeks ago in Edmonton, I was asked to be part of a, of a, a gathering called E-Town that brought together about 1,000 young entrepreneurs in Edmonton. And I was asked if I would introduce Tom Peters, who was their guest speaker at the opening session, and then do a little interview with him. And at first I thought, you know, Tom Peters, you know, in search of excellence, the economist said that's the best business book that's ever been written. And I kind of have, you know, this shows you my implicit attitudes. I have a sort of a kind of prejudice against people whose books are always for sale at the airport. You sort of think, ah, you know. You know, read this book and you will be smart and rich. And I go, oh, yeah, sure. But anyway, I have to say that he really is very, he is very smart and he's very good. And incidentally, if you go onto his website, tompeters.com, all of the slides that he ever uses in his speeches are on the website. He says you can use them and they're full of data points. So if you want to be writing a speech, you want some ideas, go onto the website. But he talked about two things. He talked about the importance of people, investing in people, in companies, and that the companies who do well are ones who invest in their people. And the other one was women. And he said, if you're not paying attention to women, if you don't have them in your management, if you don't understand they're making 70% of all the consumption decisions in society, well, you're just, you're just hopeless. So after the, the, his speech, when I went to interview him, I said, well, first of all, I'm in love. And, uh, <laughs> but it was interesting because here is a guy who is as pragmatic as they come and who goes around and tells people how to succeed, and these were his messages. So this brings me back to where we are tonight. One of the wonderful things about this community, about the Ismaili community, is that you get this. And I've been telling the leaders here that I've had the opportunity to meet His Highness Aga Khan at the Canadian Ambassador's Residence in Paris. But one day I also met Prince Amin on the plane. We were flying from, from uh, Paris to Toronto. And I had a lovely chat with him. And that sort of got me interested in what you're doing. And he said, you know, have you seen our, our Center for Pluralism in Ottawa, the museum we're doing in, uh, in Toronto? And I thought, isn't this interesting? Because pluralism is really what we're talking about. You know, if some people talk about tolerance. Now, because tolerance sort of sounds like they're sort of a group that can take its position for granted and will tolerate the other people. But pluralism is something different. I belong to an organization called the Club of Madrid. It's almost 100 now, former presidents and prime ministers, all with very strong democratic credentials promoting democratic values. And one of our thematic projects that we do is called the Shared Societies Project, because 90% of the countries in the world have minorities of at least 10%. And it's just the, the, our project is designed to bring together a toolkit of things that countries like Canada have learned to, to do to make it possible to live with these kinds of diverse populations. But pluralism has this wonderful underlying philosophical foundation of respect. It's not tolerance, it's respect. That people come together and in a pluralistic society, everybody gets a voice. And I think that that pluralistic value starts 
with women and men. I think in a society where women are not equal, chances are you will find a kind of tribalism or ethnic exclusion uh, in the rest of society. I think the value comes from very close to your life. But when women and men respect each other, and they're not all alike, but when they respect the value that each brings, that's the foundation of a broader respect in the community. And so this is one of the wonderful centers in our community where Ismailis are contributing to that value, that value of respect, that value of saying we're not all alike, and I might like some things about you and not like other things about you, but we're all part of a society where if we are all heard, if diversity is reflected in our institutions, reflected in the way we make decisions, chances are we'll make better decisions. Chances are our organizations will work better, our government will work better, and our society will be more prosperous, stable, and happy. So women and men, women leaders, are an integral part of that. And we're past the stage now, as I say, where we have to take it on faith. We know what women can contribute. And you see it in your own community. And you have obviously recognized that in choosing women leaders here in British Columbia and in Ontario. And so I am optimistic that with the leadership of communities like this community, we will move to a greater participation and a greater recognition of these voices throughout our society. And that our ethical commitment will be, as I say, not just understanding the difference between right and wrong, but understanding our ethical obligation to be the best we possibly can be. And this is the kind of place where it starts. Thank you very much. A real pleasure to be here. I have to say it's such a thrill um, to have a chance to hear you and to talk with you. And let me um, begin by saying that uh, I was really interested when you talked about the implicit attitudes test because I've taken that yeah. test and I've worked for a long time in the area of gender equality and I showed a real bias against women when I took the test as well or at least I showed that dominant stereotypes were very much structuring my thinking too. So it's very interesting how hard it is to really escape those attitudes. And I'm, you, know, you talked a bit about ways in which we can do that. And given your experience in the political realm, and given what is still you know, low percentages of women in elected offices in Canada, we're kind of middle of the pack to low level in terms of other countries in the world. Speaking, say, specifically about the federal arena, what sorts of things should we be doing to try and get more women into elected office. At the, you know, we're, we're, we're in the middle of an election across our municipalities. Um, it's a really good time to think about that. But in reference to members of parliament or members of cabinet, what sorts of measures would you like to see come into place? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, the idea of gender parity, meaning sort of half and half, um, has become quite popular around the world. And many countries have actually passed laws. France has a parity law, which is sort of surprising. But the problem with, uh, with our system of government is that it's very difficult to do that because even the most well-intentioned party leader can't really guarantee that 50% of his or her caucus will be women, even if they recruit candidates. And also, because we tend to nominate at the constituency level, often there's a resentment if a party leader wants to parachute somebody in in order to achieve a certain social goal. So I have proposed that we do something that we used to have here in Vancouver, and that is create two-member constituencies. We used to have them at the provincial level. When I was elected to the legislature in 86, in Vancouver Point Grey, it was a two-member constituency, and actually there were two women elected, uh, and Darlene Marzari from the NDP and I from Social Credit were elected, it was interesting. Uh, and the idea is not to double the size of the House of Commons, but to decide how big it should be and then work backward and consolidate constituencies. So each constituency would, not, would elect a man and a woman. So each party in every riding would nominate a man and a woman. Now, I realize it's not a 100% perfect solution, but it's the best that I can come up with given our system because it still allows for local nomination. But when I was in Prince Edward Island at my wonderful experience and of meeting 22 other women who didn't think at all like me, um, 
I, I was told that Prince Edward Island had two member constituencies till 1996. And when they got rid of them, it was for no particular reason, but that they had a, uh, an electoral commission to redraw the boundaries and they decided to go to single member constituencies and that they had them in other maritime provinces. And do you know why they used them? They used them for many decades to balance Protestants and Catholics. So at each constituency, the Conservatives would nominate a Protestant and a Catholic. The Liberals would nominate a Protestant and a Catholic. Whatever parties were running, they would nominate. So that people would usually vote a party ticket. And that meant that each religion would be represented. Because for many years, that was important. That was, that was a significant division. And in order to achieve that parity of religious communities, they used two-member constituencies. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Why couldn't you do that with men and women? And that way, men and women wouldn't be fighting against each other. They would be collaborating. Each riding would have a man and a woman candidate. They'd have a man and a woman representative. And I served in a two-member constituency. It was no problem. All of the Vancouver ridings, the Victoria ridings had them. And if you think, the United States Senate is an electoral body that has two member constituencies. So it's not unknown, but it would be instant parity. And the reason why I say this is that when you say, what can we do? Well, one of the things is, um, Gina Davis, the American actress, has a foundation about girls in the media. She's very concerned that there are so few female characters in these children's shows. And she says, if you can see it, you can be it. And one of the things that's very important is this landscape. You know, I did not want to make a career out of being a former prime minister, but I get letters from kids. In most provinces, grade five is when they do the social studies and they study the prime ministership. They'll say, we're studying the prime ministership and I'm doing my paper on you and could you please fill out this 50 page questionnaire? <laughs> and I say, that's why I have a website, honey, with FAQs, but anyway. Um, but the point is that if I'm not there, there is no female prime minister. And it's very interesting because a lot of people think I'm the shortest serving prime minister. No, I'm not. John Turner was prime minister half as long as I was. <laughs> and Charles Tepper was prime minister less than I was. I'm the third shortest serving prime minister. <laughs> or, or the so, something highest. But I'm the longest serving female prime minister. <laughs> The short answer to your question is, what can we do? We have to make women visible. We have to make this seem as something so that our implicit attitudes are, ah, women do this. And that is why having women premiers, even though traditionally in Canada they don't go on to be prime minister, but having them there, we see people who look and sound different from the traditional people in that job, we become accustomed to it. It's less strange. The voice is different, the, maybe the way of expressing is different, but it comes to be it used to seem more normal. Yeah. Like women lawyers. Uh, women law professors. Women law professors. Yeah. <laughs> last night I was at... Maybe event, not event. so much anymore. But. There, there was a group of women at an event I was at last night who said, we're the unicorns. And I said, what are the unicorns? They said, women math professors. Yeah. We're as rare as unicorns. Well, that's a great answer. And I have to say, I really wanted my 14-year-old daughter to come tonight for precisely that set of reasons. But she has a birthday party. <laughs> so you were trumped by a birthday party, but I'm going to go home and talk about you to her. Um, I have one more question um, before I, I come to the ones that have come from the audience. And I'm just going to throw you into the sort of storm that's happening online right now. So Time Magazine apparently every year publishes a list of words that we need to get rid of. And this year's list had the word feminism as one of the words we should toss. What's your sense of do we now, still need that word? Now, here is a corporation that I can guarantee you does not have a lot of women in its senior management. <laughs> Shoot me. I can't, I mean, I, actually, I'm on Twitter. You know what I have? I have 13,500 Twitter followers. And I think of that. Isn't that great? And I think 13,500 and, you know, 7 billion people in the world is probably not a big deal. <laughs> but I was about to tweet on that today and say, I mean, what are they thinking? I don't know. I, I, I think the fact that they think we don't need it means we really need it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but even if we didn't need it, you know, get away from our word. <laughs> Okay, good, I like that, hands off our word. Um, so I have some, some great questions here, and I'm gonna start off um, from that wonderful answer uh, with a question that's come from the audience, and I'm gonna read, it's a bit long, but I'm gonna read it all because it, it's, it's very nicely put. Often we hear that women don't want to be involved in, involved in politics because the media is, are so hard on them and pays so much attention to their appearance and personal lives 
or because it's so hard on family life? What advice would you give to a young woman who wants to enter public service but feels that the odds are stacked against her? Well, the short answer is go for it. Um, it's actually quite wonderful. Yes, the slings and arrows of outrageous journalists is very aggravating. But there is a growing level of awareness about bias in media coverage and people see it. The only way we change it is by being there. We can't change it in the abstract and say, well, it's all perfect now and now I can go in. You have to be there. And I want to say this to you because I've had some very difficult experiences in politics, but I don't really remember them because I had so many wonderful experiences. First of all, I was a Soviet specialist in my youth. And I now travel in places like Kyrgyzstan, where I saw Nur Jahan, and, and you know, I've been in Tunisia and all sorts of countries where people are trying to build democracies. We are so lucky. Democracy is a blunt instrument. It's not a precision tool. And we must grasp our responsibility as citizens to make it work. So we cannot allow ourselves to be discouraged. And if you want to participate, you go for it. Yes, it can be aggravating. And, and sometimes from, from you know, left field, like a woman feminist talking about my earrings. But it's not so terrible. And if women don't go, they won't change the culture. There was a time when there were just a handful of women, or one woman, in the House of Commons. When I was there, it was, I think we were about 20%. But it, there was enough that it was no longer odd to hear a woman's voice. And I'll tell you, when I tabled my sexual assault legislation, it was remarkable because men stood up and said, the fear of sexual assault is something that women live with all the time. And it's very important for us to have this good legislation and I'm supporting it. That was a change, it was a cultural change. And it was a change because women were there, not, not just the women in parliament because the men also have wives and daughters who give them an earful, but because they had female colleagues who could broaden their understanding. You know, if, if it's only men and they're making decisions, they will make decisions often that will not reflect well on women, that will not be what we want. But they won't do it because they're mean. They'll do it because nobody is sitting with them and saying, you know, here's why that doesn't work. It's the same thing when I was doing my gun control legislation. You know, I talked to people who owned guns. Surprise, surprise. You know, what would happen if we did this? And they would say, well, you know, it's very nice, but nobody will comply with that. And that's really not how, but here is, if you try that, this would be, you know, you took, it, real flesh and blood people are affected. So you need to have those voices. That's why you need to be there. And any woman who wants to be involved in politics, I, I can do nothing but encourage you. It is a privilege. It is a delight. You will get to know your community in ways that you otherwise never would have. I mean, I would not know members of this community had I not been in public life. And there are people here in public life precisely because they love knowing about a world beyond their own. So we have to do it. And, you know, Harry Truman once said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. <laughs> and I think if you think that being in public life is going to fill some inner need, uh, you know, that, you know, that, you, that, you know, you know, have friends and have family. But what gives you the balance, people say, well, how do you take all that? It's when you go out and you meet people. When you're out, when the summer of 1993, going across Canada and meeting people who were so excited to have a woman as prime minister, that for all the meanness, those individual people and their warmth and hugging and just being there, it made me feel such a part of the country. It was wonderful. So there are a lot of compensations. Yes, it's hard. But a lot of things are hard. You know, being a ballet dancer is hard. You know, I mean, there, there, nothing you can do that's worth doing is going to be without a struggle. But please, women, do not say it's not for me. It is for you. And the only way we're going to get to parity, and as I say, even if we have my two member constituencies, women will have to stand up and do it, have to come forward. And we need you. What were your peak experiences as prime minister? So you've talked about the connection that you were able to make with people, in particular their excitement at having a female prime minister. If there were two or three or even one other thing that you treasure from that time, what would it be? Well, I think, you know, the general satisfaction of being able to finally put an end to the fact we'd had no women prime ministers. But there were lots of things, you know, going to the G7 summit, that was very exciting, representing Canada mm -hmm. there. <laughs> well, and what was really funny was, 
Bill Clinton apologized to me because, I don't know if you remember, the Americans had set off some cruise missiles in Iraq uh, and hadn't told us about it. This was in an earlier incarnation in Iraq after the Gulf War. And uh, I, when I was there, he, the, President Clinton invited me to the American Embassy for lunch the last day. We had our officials, and he and I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and then we had a uh, meeting with our officials, and then we did a press conference together. And just to show you what the Canadian, I mean, this is why you have to, you, you can't take this press stuff seriously. So the, so the President, so I guess somebody asked him about this, you know, the fact that we had not been notified. And he said, you know, yes, and I apologize to the Prime Minister about that. Everybody's writing down. Bill Clinton apologizes to our Prime Minister. Triumph. I come home. Tri really. I mean, the fact that guy's got good manners. But, you know, so things like that, you know, they kind of make you realize that on the one hand, here you are, you know, you're really, you know, with the big guys and Helmut Cole and Francois Mitterrand and Bill Clinton. And, and you know, and it's just really people. And the, and the Canadian press are just salivating for all the wrong things. So that was sort of interesting. But uh, then there was a time I went to address the General Assembly. And uh, the plane that brought me then went back with, you know, my blouse that I needed for a suit, which was not designed to be worn without a blouse. Um, <laughs> and I had to run and borrow one from our did ambassador. Did you still have the same pair of earrings, though? For that I, think I, I think I did, just, yeah. out of, just out of spite. But, um, <laughs> but it, it, there were just, well, you know, I mean, I was the first prime minister to convene a first minister's meeting before G7, because a lot of the issues in G7 actually relate to provincial jurisdiction. And aside from the fact that Bob Ray didn't come, he said it was only going to be a, a photo op. And I've, I've, I've known him since then. And I said, you know, I actually thought they were growing lemons in Ontario because you certainly were sucking on one when I went to meet you. <laughs> oh, he was really obnoxious. He was terrible. He admits he was. But anyway, but it was a great meeting. And I remember the senior official, the, the, the federal official who uh, was, was staffing me on it, just sort of astonished at what a great meeting it was. But, you know, I had served at all three levels of government. So I understood how people thought at the provincial level in the same way that I understood how, Stan, how important municipal government is. I mean, you know, you don't go someplace else to serve your constituents. You're right there nose to nose, and the decisions you make affect people the next day. So it's a very important place to learn your political instincts. But um, so things like that that I did, uh, you know, I think when I redesigned the ministries of the government, uh, that that was, it was very popular, but it was also really good. I created the Department of Canadian Heritage. Um, it hasn't done things that I would like it to have done. I, I brought it together because when we did the two unsuccessful attempts to amend the Constitution, uh, it was clear to me that Canadians didn't know enough about one, know enough about one another. And education, K-12, is a provincial jurisdiction. So I wanted to bring together all the federal government powers in, in culture, commemoration, uh, all of the things that we did in that area. And I was hoping we could perhaps begin to build resources to teach about Canada, particularly for adults, because we have a lot of adult immigrants, people who aren't educated here. And how do you make people feel part of Canada if they don't understand the history? They, you know, they may learn a little bit to pass their citizenship test, but maybe there are ways we could make it better. I created the Freestanding Department of Health, the Department of Public Security. So um, I take a lot of pride in that. I think those were decisions that stood the test of time. Yeah, And they were great. fun. People say, do you miss politics? I say, I miss making real decisions. There's something about being at the center of the action. So I say to you, you know, people say, ew, you know, it's all about power. You know, we don't have power. Power exists. Power exists. Somebody's going to have it. And if you would exercise it ethically and conscientiously and in the national interest, why shouldn't it be you? You know, I'll support you. Go for it. Anyway, sorry. No, great. And, and, um, They're all running out to file their nomination papers. Good. Yeah, but I'm actually going to stick a bit with the jewelry theme because this next question borrows um, a metaphor from Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, and she calls it the Tierra Syndrome, which is that if women just believe if they keep at their jobs, doing a good job, that they'll get the notice they deserve, they'll get the Tierra. And so the question from this person is, what advice would you give women, particularly, I think, young women, about how to advocate for themselves, to take risks, to challenge themselves, and to ask for that tiara or ask for that promotion, and I'm moving away from the tiara imagery, which is perhaps not the best, um, although it is the one that Sandberg used? Well, you know, it's actually a very good observation. And one of the good things about politics is that you have to talk about what you've done. 
because women are, you know, girls are raised not to boast. You know, you're not supposed to boast. You're not supposed to, you know, brag about yourself. The one thing is that when you're in politics, you have to tell people what you've done because you're hoping they'll say yay and vote for you for another term. So that's, it's easier to overcome that. But a friend of mine set up the program on global leadership and diversity at Goldman Sachs. And one of the things that she found very frustrating was that the men, when they got it, they made a deal. They go to their, their supervisor and they go, oh, I just made this incredible, even at the thing I didn't even say, I just made this incredible deal and we're gonna make this money and this is, I'm so great, and, you know. And women who did such a thing couldn't do it. And she'd say, if you can't go and tell them in person, leave a voicemail. But she found that it was really, really hard for women to tell the people who needed to know what they'd accomplished. And, and, and that is something where I think, it, why it's so important for women and men to work together. Because we have a lot to learn from men. You know, men know how this, this thing works. And, but it also means that in organizations, people have to understand that maybe they have to reach out and find out what people are doing. She, the, Laura, let her name, she wrote a book called The Loudest Duck. Because she said in American culture, we say, uh, speak up, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. In China, they say, don't speak up, because the loudest duck gets shot. <laughs> so there are different cultures about how people behave. So it isn't just women and men. It also can be different cultures where people are, are you know, socialized not to be speaking up that way. So one of the things that we can do is, as bosses and supervisors and leaders is to recognize that maybe good people are doing good things, and, and it's our job to figure out what they're doing. But, it, but it's very true, what she says, that it's, it's hard for a lot of women to blow their own horn. Because, and let's face it, because maybe we don't like women who blow their own horn. And as I say, the only good thing about politics is that that's your job. So, you know, you do it and phew, it's easy. So I, I think we've got time for one more question and I'm gonna combine two of the questions that have come in. And one of the questions really talks specifically about combining a career, so working in the paid labor market and family, which is what you do as unpaid labor at home. And that there is this message that young women get that you can't have both. You can't do both. You can't have everything. And, that, and I know in the legal profession, for example, that a lot of women find it really hard to have children and stay working at the pace that's expected of them. And so the question is, what, really, what are your thoughts on this, on the, the, the role that a career outside the home and work inside the home with family play, so importantly to so many of us, and um, just to ask you to talk about that. And of course, it's really um, been you know, quite an important piece in thinking about whether women will go into politics or not. And then another question is about whether um, the role for women in a leadership position might be different to pace, depending or based upon where a particular woman is in her life continuum. And I can see that also being very connected back to the same question about balancing family and career and the way in which women feel they have to do it that is not necessarily true of yeah. men. It's a personal decision for everybody. I've known men who say, I'd like to go into politics, but I want to make, make my money first. I want to you know, have enough money so that I'm free. I don't feel, you know. So, I mean, it's, 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 some people want to start young, some people want to start old. Some people want to have their children young, some people want to have their children older. You know, I think it's an individual decision for every person. But um, what is the name of that wonderful woman who's the head of Pepsi, PepsiCo, um, Inder... I can't remember her last name. I mean, she's, I've, I've seen her and she speak, And she always says that the way you do it is you marry the right guy. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. That different couples have different relationships. Uh, Carly Fiorina, who became the, uh, the CEO of Hewlett Packard, had a husband who was also in the same business. And he could see that she was destined for stardom. And they decided that he would be the one that would stay home and look after their son and make it possible for her to do that. Now, that's not going to be for everybody, but the point is that women you know, can decide you know, when they want to do things. One of the reasons why municipal politics is great is because you don't have to go someplace else to serve your constituents. And I think municipal politics is a great, way to learn, a great place to learn to be a politician. I started on the Vancouver School Board. And first of all, the school board is great because people are really passionate. If you want to know that you have the temperament for politics, be a school trustee and sit in a gym where people are screaming at you. You will find out very soon whether you can take it or not. But the point is that it's a great way, because municipal politics, you do everything. You do policy, you do labor relations, you do budgeting, you do communications, you do all of that stuff. So you get a very good sense of what, 
what politics and public policy making is about. And then if you want, you can you know, run provincially or run federally, if, you know, if, if it suits your, your life at that time. Um, I think in Parliament, it's, it's more family friendly than it used to be. I mean, when I went there, we had done away with night sittings, uh, which was, you know, which was great. People don't really want to sit there all night. Um, it's hard. It's hard if you're from British Columbia, because uh, you're, you're a long way away. Uh, but each person's decision is, is personal. But I used to, when I taught at UBC, I used to have a little chart on the door of my office, and it was something that Homemakers Magazine had done. It said most women, the, their last child is in school by the time they're 34. And they did a little thing in life expectancy, I guess, was 74. What is 34 by then? 78, 68, whatever. It doesn't matter. But there was this little pie chart, then it said, what are you doing for the other half of your life? But the idea being that Yes, you may focus on one thing, but then there's time that you can plan for doing something else. It's very individual, but I think it's also important in these institutions to push for amenities that make it easier. So, for example, when I was in Parliament, on average one week in four we didn't sit, which was very important if you were from, from British Columbia, because it meant that week I could come home, and if the Board of Trade met on a Wednesday, for example, I could talk to them. Because otherwise, it was, it was just weekends, so that I could come home for an extended period of time. I didn't come home so often, but I came home more productively. So there are ways. But now, I mean, and, and that was in ye olden days, before the internet. Ah! Before the internet and cell phones and all of that kind of stuff. And there's no reason why our institutions of government can't respond to become more user-friendly in a country the size of Canada. You know, I mean, we really need to think about that, and especially if you're from British Columbia. You know, my colleagues who are from Toronto or, or, or Montreal, I mean, they can go midweek to an evening event in their riding and be back in time the next day. We couldn't. So I think that there's two things. One is to say it's individual. Different people have different uh, support mechanisms. But if we want people to participate in these institutions, and preferably people in different stages of life, we need to push to make them more user-friendly, make it possible to vote electronically, for example, on some issues. Uh, you know, why not? And let's be, let's be modern. And if we, if we pride ourselves in being a country that has overcome distance, let's overcome <coughs> distance to make it possible to have the widest possible representation in our House of Commons. Yeah, no, that, that really makes sense. And really what you're saying is that the change at the level of the institution of the system can be done to ensure that you can be both a good member of parliament, say, and a good parent. Yeah. That you don't have to pick one or the other. Yeah. And it's an exciting life. I mean, you have opportunities to share things with your children, too. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that everybody who's parents has challenges, even if you're, you're, you're not going anywhere else. And you have to decide what are the challenges that you can deal with and how you're going to deal with them. But again, if women aren't there, and if people, and it's not just women, men also care about this. When we did away with night sittings, it wasn't just because women wanted to do it. The men don't want to, you know, you, when I first went to Parliament, we had night, sit night sittings because in the 88 election, we had to get the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement passed. Because as you recall, the, the Liberal Senate had refused to ratify it. And we had to get it passed so it could take effect January 1st of 80, 89. So we had night sittings, and it was fun as a new member of parliament because you set up with the, all the veterans, and they would, you know, in the parliamentary dining room, they'd be telling them all these stories of all the, the, the funny things they used to get, you know, the trouble they used to get into and the terrible things that used to happen. But actually, you know, they don't really want to sit all night, you know, drinking, waiting for votes. I mean, they want to go home to their families. They want to have a life. And this is something that, that men and women can, can you know, Act, act, you know, push for it together, agitate for it together, because it isn't just women who want, men want to have a decent life, a family life. They don't want to always be tired. They don't want to be away from their families so much. And uh, together, I think we can transform the way those institutions function. I'm sitting beside a piece of Canadian history. Um, Female prime I'm minister. I'm not sure how I should sit when somebody. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Straighten up. Sit tall and proudly. But so you're the you're our first female prime minister, and I hope that it won't be long before you're not our only Me too. female prime minister, and that you're the sort of uh, leading light in a long line I of so. fabulous women. 
to come and occupy so political office in Canada. But thank you for coming and talking to us in such an engaging and uh, rich way.